All right, welcome in, everybody. This is season two of The Lab presented by Champion Circle, and we're starting off with a bang, a literal bang, as we're happy to introduce the new men's basketball coach, Dusty May. Coach, thank you so much for joining us. First off, where are you Where are you calling us from? Are you in Ann Arbor? Are you moved in? Are you settled into the city? How's the city been treating you? Well, I'm, I'm in Ann Arbor in the office, and uh, I wouldn't say I'm settled in yet. I, I've been on the road recruiting. I went back to South Florida for a day uh, to tie up some loose ends and uh, meet with some uh, in, important people. But yeah, back in Ann Arbor, I'm uh, slowly navigating the city, but uh, it's tough after dark. Uh, there's just a lot to do in the office. I'm sure you're busy. I've been seeing it. You're filling out your staff. Um, of course, you'll have to help, you know, look at the transfer portal, start to look at your roster as a whole. Uh, you know, as we know in coaching, it, you know, you can never really sleep. Right. And I, I kind of want to start there because this is new. You're coming from FAU. Um, I, I wonder if it would be beneficial if you could just talk about who you are as a person, your coaching philosophy, why basketball is important to you. Just a general layout for some of our viewers so they can get to know Dusty May, the person. And we can talk about Dusty May, the coach as well. Well, Jake, I'm very simple as a person. Um, the, the job consumes me, and, and I don't say that as a, a badge of honor. Um, I love every part of this game. I love the relationships that come with it. Um, outside of what I do professionally, uh, my family uh, is, is extremely important to me. I have three sons that are all involved in basketball. Two of them are, are walk-ons. Uh, one's finishing his career at Florida now, one's at Central Florida, and then uh, my youngest, Eli, is going to be joining us here. And so it, it, it's all intertwined. But um, the, the relationship with coaches, most of the staffs I'm on, those guys become my closest friends. Um, I've been blessed to work with great people and, and coach quality guys. And, and ultimately, that's why guys like me are able to get this job because you've you've been uh, blessed and touched by so many people. Yeah, you know, I, it's the higher up you go, the more it it's it's almost not separate from your life. It, it is part of you. It like lives in your DNA. And I, I know just from observing Coach Harbaugh and some of the coaches I played with at college in the NFL, if it if you don't bleed that sport, if you don't bleed coaching, you're not going to make it. it. It is a serious, serious sacrifice. Um, and, and you kind of touched on it. Some of your mentors, I think most famously, Bobby Knight is the one I'd like to talk to you about because you were a student manager for him back at Indiana. Correct. Um, I what? Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. No. What did you learn from him? What was that experience like? It was a unique journey, and back then things were a lot different than they are now. And and I played Division II um, in Southern Indiana and, and was frustrated with the experience I was having. And so I decided the best way for me to be a high school basketball coach in Indiana was to go work for Coach Knight. And back then there weren't video coordinators, there weren't director of basketball operations, there weren't graduate assistants, there weren't walk-ons. You had scholarship players, a head coach, three assistants, a trainer and a couple secretaries. And so it was almost as if you became part of the staff by your sophomore, junior, senior year as a manager. And there was a hierarchy, but it trained you for the job that you were going to have to do if you were able to get a full-time position. And after that is when the staff started to grow. And so it was, it was like everything else. It, it was great timing that I was prepared. I was hungry. Um, but what I learned from coach Knight was uh, how to, uh, anticipate how to solve problems. Um, that trade alone is is probably the thing that that um, I look back on, and, and I'm very very grateful that I was a part of the program because you always had to be thinking of thinking ahead. You had to be, um, you know, just thinking what could the worst case scenario be, and now figure out a way to solve it. And it may not ever happen. Uh, there were systems for everything, the attention to detail, the preparation. Nothing was ever left to chance. And everyone that I worked with and everyone that I was around have all uh, moved into the, the real world and, and, and done well um, in, in whatever that is, whether it's business, whether it's athletics, administration, they've all been able to, to uh, sustain success in whatever their field because I think those habits and it, it becomes ingrained in you. It's, it's like yeah. it was like the military. I was going to say, I mean, those principles apply to sports. They apply to life. They were applied to relationships. Uh, just the ability to logically think through potentials. You just don't know what the next moment might bring, but you can be prepared if you can think through those things. 
definitely applies on the court, obviously applies off the court. I, I Just talking to you, getting to know you here just for a few minutes, you're an easygoing guy. You're a laid-back guy. <laughs> coach Knight, on the other hand, a little bit more intense. My, my high school basketball coach, you know, we call him like a mini coach. Now he'd throw chairs on the sideline. He'd, you know, dog cuss us in the locker room. You know, it's one of those things where you laugh about it years later. Uh, you know, what about your personality as a coach though? Because I, I do, I, I can't help but notice the way sports have changed, particularly college sports. We can talk about NIL in a second, but it is a different game today than it was when coach Knight was a coach. Uh, how have you adapted to that change? Well, it, it, when I was in graduate school uh, at Indiana, I, I did a deep dive in how coaching was changing at that time, the early 2000s. And I, I do think back in the day, there was so much more of a military uh, background in a lot of our coaches. And then my coach coached me the same way. And I'm grateful for it because it was it was right for me and I embraced it. Um, but then when I was in college, I started co- when I when I was chasing this goal of making it in some capacity in college basketball, I, I started coaching AAU basketball in the summer and I had a really good team. And, and literally I was a five foot nine miniature uh, Robert Montgomery night for summer. And I was screaming at everyone. I was going, you know, it, busting blood vessels at halftime because a kid, you know, missed a whatever a blockout. And after that summer, I don't know, I'm very, uh, I'm hard on myself by nature. I'm very uh, reflective. Uh, I try to be self-aware. And I realized that that didn't work very well for me and no one enjoyed it. And I don't think anyone got better. And so I knew that wasn't the way I was going to be. And then there were all these moments throughout your career as you're young, trying to figure out who you're going to be that shaped my way. And I realized I couldn't just snap at guys and tell them to do this. It had to be, I, w- I had to earn their trust. It had to be more of a collaboration. It had to be a partnership. And then as I've, I've gotten older and I've, I've tried to, to really improve every year, um, I've learned what, uh, you know, when you're in, in a high performance uh, period, which our players are, it's very, there's a lot of stress and stressors coming at them. So everything I do during the game is, is simply to try to help them and not distract them from what they should be focused on. And now in practice and workouts, I'm, I'm extremely intense. I'm, I'm not confrontational um, in a negative way, but I'm very, very direct. I'm very, I, I do feel like we have a high level of accountability and the players know what's really important to me and what I value and then outside of that, we encourage them to be creative, to, to be themselves while also conforming to, to this group or this team. It's it's really important to be able to do both. And I, I think one of the big pieces is the social media. Like when you talk about, you know, maybe maybe players needed to be challenged by their coach, you know, 30 years ago, whatever timeline. But today, you know, you got to be able to do a little bit of both and a good leader knows when to push and when to pull back. Uh, and you talk about trust, you talk about that relationship with your players, but we are in the world of NIL and, and I'm, I'm asking from my own curiosity because I know this has been a topic for the fan base in football in basketball in any sport that it applies. NIL, there's no denying that it's a big piece of college sports today. And of course, we're presented by Champion Circle. You did a campaign called the March with May, correct? With Champion Circle, could That's you correct. tell? Can you tell us a little bit about that? And I also saw a quote. You said you spent about twenty to thirty percent of your time on NIL. I assume some of that means recruiting. Could you could you lay out what the March for May is and why NIL is important to you? The March for May is more of a crowdsourcing just to try to, to, I guess, raise the level of awareness and the impact of of every dollar counts, every uh, uh, opportunity counts. They all add up, especially when you think about the power and the strength of, of this block M. Um, and, and we and if we all chip in, then, then we can really do something great for, for all of us. Um, but it's it's a daily effort. And, and that, that might be a slight exaggeration, but it's not when you factor in that every single recruiting call, every Zoom, one of the three main factors always ends up being NIL. And I do embrace it. Um, I, I struggle with the transactional nature of it being the most important thing. And, and even and, uh, you know, a, a lot of times us coaches, I, I, I think we expect more out of these young men than we do ourselves. 
and I've, I've tried to be even transparent with, with my processes of jobs and whatnot. And, and even with our guys at FAU, um, they read last year that I was in, uh, up for jobs and this and that. And, and I explained to them that I'm, uh, we're all sacrificing here and I'm not, I'm not telling you that to earn any, any more um, equity with you. I'm just saying that this is part of being a, you know, a, a member of something great. And then you, you come here and, and the contract was never the length of years was never my priority with, with any of these jobs. I wanted to, to, to pursue the job that fit me. And I felt like we could be the absolute best we could be. And so, but then again, when, when these players and, and everyone looks and sees how much coaches make, they naturally want a bigger piece of the pie. Um, they deserve more than, than what they were getting. Um, but there's just, it's such an unregulated market and you, you never know, but I do want uh, all the players that that that, I, that play for us uh, to be taken care of, and, and what I mean taken care of to to be able to to have their parents attend games, to be able to um, eat what they need to eat, to be a high performing athlete, and also my goal uh, with anyone that has NIL is is uh, save enough money where it, it, no matter what happens next, you can at least have a down payment on a house, and you have some uh, you have a nest egg built. But it, it's tough because. You know, everyone has a different amount. Everyone's different, but um, it's important, but it can't be the most important thing because no matter what the amount of money is, it's, it's not that hard to spend. Yeah. You know, I, I, I wrote that down because, you know, when you say NIL is always one of the top three priorities, you know, like I remember when I was choosing to play at Michigan, I'm like, man, I value education. I wanted to play on the big stage. I wanted to compete with great teams like that I wanted my family to be able to see me. It's easy for me to say I wouldn't have prioritized money, but I don't think that'd be fully truthful, especially with the the, the state of NIL. You cannot deny its importance in today's world. Um, what what support have you received from the university, from the collective, from Champion Circle? What's been your initial experience here in terms of alignment? That's a word that always comes up with NIL. Do Was that a factor in choosing Michigan as well? Did you feel you were going to get investment and alignment from those around you in terms of NIL? Without a doubt. I, I knew how much people uh, loved this university and wanted Michigan to be the best in everything. Um, there wasn't any type of, of guarantees or assurances. There was, you know, there, there were discussions, but, but I believed because of the alignment, because of the potential, because um, the the ever the, the landscape we're in, the, the power of, of this university, it, it could be done. But also, I, I knew that I have to be directly involved, and it's a it's a partnership. It's um, you know we have to do this together, and also it's not as if um, the people who are giving aren't getting something in return. They they're a, a part of our success. They they should feel a part of it. And and in all honesty, I'm not saying it can't be done without it, but it it's rare, and it's getting even it's getting more difficult by the minute. And yeah. so. Um, you know, you, you adapt or die, but also I, I do think the, the, our athletes, our, our young men, they're going to be here are going to be marketable. They're going to, to have real, um, NIL deals. They've got business opportunities. They've got promotional opportunities. And, and those things are, are unbelievably, um, I guess, uh, productive for later in their lives for these guys to, to speak in front of cameras, for them to learn how to, um, you know, to go to an acting class because they have to shoot a commercial to do things like that. It's, you know, those things, cause some of them want to go into broadcasting. So it's, it's reps, it's experience, it's real life, um, type of stuff. I would completely agree with you. And one thing I've, I've tried to, you know, offer to ward or, or Jim coach Harbaugh when he was there, even parents of players is, Hey, there's a value to that block M on your chest. It may not be like a deposit directly into your bank, but I know it to be absolutely true. Now that I'm in sports media, there is a big time value to being under the umbrella of the Michigan Wolverine family. And I don't know how to quantify that, but it's undeniable that it's valuable. And it, <clears throat> it leads me to another question to you, coach, because you know, this was a quick turnaround from the end of your season at FAU to joining Michigan. Your name had been rumored and connected to a few different universities. You, you know, you're one of the hotter names uh, in the coaching search for a number of different programs. Why Michigan? You know, like why, why, why was this the place? Because 
the program struggled. It was, I, I believe it was the record for the least amount of wins in program history last year. Um, it was a tough, challenging season. Why did you choose to come to Ann Arbor and, and coach the men's basketball team? Well, Jake, it was, it, to be honest, it was an easy decision for me because we all perceive places and things differently. And my perception of this place was just incredible on, on so many fronts. And, and I didn't feel that way until I lived here, whatever, 18 years ago when I took a job at Eastern Michigan, I moved to the area. And I would come over to, to eat in, in, in Ann Arbor and hang out. And I was like, wow, this place just feels different. And I'm a big feel guy. I'm fairly impulsive when something feels right. And so uh, my youngest son, who was born here, he always rooted for Michigan because he was born here and this was his connection. And when you're a coach, you're, you're moving to a different state every year or two. So when the, the his brothers are rooting for Auburn or whoever, when we lived in Alabama, he was rooting for, for Michigan. And I, I worked with I worked with a, a, a guy that grew up in Michigan. So he's saying uh, hell to the victor every morning walking into to our cubicles. Um, and so just this place, I, I always was a closet Michigan football fan. It, you know, nothing. Uh, when you grow up in southern Indiana, most people root for Notre Dame or, or someone like that. And, and I always gravitated towards this. So I, I think it was more just my perception and the pride that people have both in the academic side and the athletics and, and then the, just the culture, uh, the, 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 the social aspect of this place. It, it just it fit me for my values. And I felt like we could uh, attract high achieving people that valued the block M in the next 70 years after they leave here, as opposed to simply everything being about instant gratification. So yeah. that's a long winded answer, but it, it felt right. I believe in everything that this place stands for. And even guys outside of our region now, I, when I call them, I say, we, we need to get on a Zoom with your parents so you can really feel the impact. You know how we're going to play. You know our teams, you played against us. But the, the thing that I'm really going to sell is what this place can do for you outside of basketball. And, and so those are the things I still believe in. I, I think that... Um, you know, the, the, the long-term benefits of coming to a place like this outweigh any NIL amount, but uh, you have to have the NIL to, to get them here. And then I think then it will, the, the train will, will, will get moving. I, you know, I, I'm biased, of course, but I don't think there's a better program that balances and provides academic excellence, athletic excellence. Hey, you don't have to choose NIL or post-career. You can get both at Michigan if you play your cards right. That That's the other piece of it is there has to be investment and work done by the player side, too. It can't just be all taking. You have to give a little bit. Um, and, and as far as athletic excellence goes, you know, we talked about the program you're inherited. And you know that you want to improve this team. But I want to take you back to, to when you took the job at FAU because I heard something that about your so you, you took the job and then within the first week you said wait a second I don't know if I have the resources to succeed here you were talking to your wife and you're like kind of questioning you know what how are we going to get this done and of course you did get it done you took the team to a final four appearance uh what was that journey like you know again just to hit that angle of who is coach Dusty May like how were you able to take FAU from where you inherited them and ultimately get them to a final four appearance. Well, Jake, full transparency. It was actually an hour or so after I accepted the job. Right away. It was right away. <laughs> and I pulled back the, yeah, because I, I had a, you know, I knew the the athletic director well. We'd worked together at Louisiana Tech prior. I, I felt great about the president. I felt great about the campus in the area of Boca Raton is one of the nicest places in, in the world. Um, and so, it, it felt right. And I, uh, I'll refer back, I'll, I'll refer back to my impulsive uh, nature. And and so they offered me the job, I signed it. And then we go to see the athletic facilities. And um, at that time, we were really, really, we were, we were far behind. And then I saw a, a group of guys working out and some of them were the team, some of them were just local students. And all of this just hit me at once. And I thought, and I, and I left a, a, a University of Florida situation where we'd just been the lead eight. We had a great team coming back. I, I, my, Family was incredibly happy. I was fulfilled professionally as, as an assistant coach. Um, I loved who I was working with every day. So I didn't really want to leave at that time and was was content never being a head coach if I did pass up on it. You know, those are the decisions we have to make as assistant coaches. But when I went, I went down to check it out and it just felt right. 
but once I saw how difficult it was going to be, I, I told my wife, we went back to the hotel to get organized after the, um, after I signed the contract. And I just, I basically broke down and said, I'm, I'm not good enough. I can't do this. There was definitely some imposter syndrome. And uh, I think there was about five minutes later and she looked at me and said something along the lines. Well, you, you've already made the decision. There's, there's no reason <laughs> I believe you'll figure it out. You'll get it done. And, and uh, you know, she's, she gives um, myself and our sons tough love. That's why they're uh, they're good they're good young men. Uh, but at that point, you take a deep breath and, and you figure out the best way to attack it. And uh, it was similar. We had ten open scholarships that year. Um, I think we had two days that we could go out recruiting, and we had maybe six official visits remaining that we could use. And so we had to rely on relationships. We had to get some guys down on unofficials. And we pieced together a, a, a good solid team because we we wanted to earn some respect in year one. And when you're taking over a program that's, you know, a, a, a below 10 win team notoriously, um, you feel like you have to make sure you earn some credibility with, with recruits. They have to at least be able to look and see your vision and it has to align uh, at least a little bit. And so we, we, we did that. We, uh, we flipped it in year one, had some injuries. We started out maybe nine and three. We beat Illinois. We beat uh, UCF's best team that went to the tournament that year. And then we had some injuries. And then I think even that second half of the year when we had three starters out, it forced me to develop even more as a coach and figure out on the fly what's the best way for us to play. And then from there, um, it was just a steady um, – incline of, uh, of daily improvement. And then uh, we were on the verge a couple of years ago and, and couldn't get over the hump. And then obviously last year um, we, we, uh, we, we found, uh, we found our stride. What does that look like? Because I, I, I you will draw, right? You'll draw on overcoming the imposter syndrome, which is natural for, for anybody trying to achieve great things. Um, you know, you talk about turning the program around, can, can you give us a little behind the scenes, like the X's and O's, like what, what's going through your head, uh, your head as a head coach saying, hey, we have got to improve as a basketball team? It's, it's simply finding the right people and, and staff and, and, and personnel and everyone. It, it always begins with the people and the, the characteristics that align with what we're going to be about. Um, and, and it's difficult in the transfer portal and even with the players here. Um, you know, a lot of times the coach comes in and he's extremely aggressive to try to keep them in, in this and that, or they're extremely um, aggressive in pushing them out the door. It, it's usually one way or the other. I've taken a different approach where I'll support you guys and let's just really get to know each other. You, uh, you know, try to evaluate if, if I'm the right coach and we'll be the right coaching staff for you. And then I'm evaluating, are you the right type of player that I want to be a part of the program? And let's give each other some time and, and just see where that ends up. So there, there could be some guys come back there. They could all leave. I don't know right now because th there's really no point in having those pointed questions this early. Um, I'm still watching film from last year. I'm still evaluating their games. They're still watching our games uh, in, in, from different parts of the season. So I think that's the healthiest way versus just going in and, and being a, a, a too aggressive one way or the other. Um, but with the transfer portal, it's tough to do all the homework necessary to find the right people. So it's it's tough because you've got to you've got to get inside their chest and find out what's inside their heart. You got to find out who influences their thoughts on a daily basis and, and try to make the best decision. Because in my opinion, and, and Coach Beeline proved this, there's not much separation between those guys, 330 to 300. Um, it, it usually comes down to who's patient, who uh, believes in development, who's about the team. Those intangibles are, are, are never going to change. I mean, I, I still, um, Mr. Ross played Bo Schimblecker's speech with the team, the team, the team. That speech still resonates with successful organizations today. Yeah, yeah. I, I completely agree. Um, you said you were, you know, watching tape, right? You're, you're familiarizing yourself with the, the basketball team, the players, the personnel from last season. Uh, you know, what are you seeing on tape? What are some of those immediate opportunities to improve? That there's some guys, well, obviously, um, when, when you have a down year, and, and, and Coach Howard would, would say the same thing, that we have to get better in a, in a lot of areas. Um, both sides of the ball, we need to get better. Uh, we, we need to um, find pieces that fit together, I think, a little bit better. It, it, it didn't look like a group that really had great connection as, as a unit. And, and we coaches probably get a little – uh, a bit too much credit or too much blame um, for this uh, component. And, and players now, 
usually the successful teams, the players enjoy playing with each other. And as coaches, that's the environment and culture we have to create and, and, and bring in the right people to buy into that. But finding a group that appreciates each other's strengths and weaknesses, they respect each other's commitment to the team and sacrificing for the team. And then it, it still goes back to the word you mentioned earlier, trust, because anytime trust is broken, then it takes a long time to get it back. So that's why the, the daily messaging, um, us as a staff walking the walk and, and living those values every single day is, is paramount to success. And so, you know, it's it's not going to be a quick fix, um, but we could win big this year. And, and, and if we get the right people, we can. But as far as the the fixing any any issue or any team, it's a daily approach. It's a minute by minute approach. It's an investment in the people every single day. And then you, you never know when uh, you, you plant the bamboo and you never know when it's going to sprout, but you know it's going to. Yeah. You know, in, in my media career, I, I talk about this often that, man, the right the right coach and the right assistants, the right coordinators, that can be a massive change to the program. Like I, I've used the analogy before, like you know, we got the colors of the rainbow, but what I'm going to paint as an artist is going to look a lot different than, you know, Da Vinci or some of the, the great painters. And I think of a coach as a great painter. You have all these colors, you have all these pieces, you have all these players, but the right basketball mind, the right football mind knows how to gel them together. And I've been following a little bit on social media as you've started to fill out your staff. And I'm curious your philosophy in what you're looking for in those coaches. You know, sometimes you might prioritize a coach that has relationships with a guy you may be pursuing in the transfer portal. Sometimes it is their basketball mind. Uh, Maybe it's about culture, like you've talked about, and fit. Uh, as you're filling out your staff, Coach, what is your philosophy and what kind of characteristics are you looking for? First and foremost, likability, and and within that is is a great teammate. Uh, competency as far as teaching the game of basketball. Um, as I've gotten um, into the profession, I've only been a head coach six years, so I'm not acting like I'm, I'm a veteran coach, but every year um, I've I've understood and realized how important it is to be able to teach the game to teach life skills. And so I try to improve every year as a teacher. So I, I, the staff has to be great communicators. They have to be great teachers. They have to be um, men that are going to pour into the players. And it's not a, a job where they go home and, and, and leave it behind because, uh, and, and we're not 20 hour day, uh, the staff's not going to be 20 hour day guys, but we're going to be uh, consumed with helping our players 24 uh, seven, 365. So all those, but and now building this staff, it's it's a lot different than than the staff that we built at FAU because at that point we had low budget, we had a, an area that's tough to raise a family in um, if you don't have great finances. So it was young, hungry guys that weren't proven, but yet they were they were they were hungry to get after it, and they they didn't have families to to you know, so they didn't have the outside stress because it was a tough situation here. Um, I'm trying to fill in my my gaps, my holes, because I have to use my time differently now than I did at, at FAU. I was much more of just a coach and recruiter there. Uh, this job, I have to wear different hats and I have to use my time, uh, obviously wise, but I have to use it in different ways. But I did feel like I needed to have a few uh, coaches with institutional knowledge of, of what's important to me, how I work. Um, and, and so that way I'm not having to teach a staff and players um, the, yeah. the, the basics and the most important things to me. So, um, you know, th th those I think are, are going to be key because I'm going to have less of a voice now than I did at, at FAU. I'm going to share um, a lot more responsibility. Um, but luckily we have such talented people around us here and so many resources that it, it's easy to share when you have high level uh, professional people around you. Yeah. I mean, really, that's alignment. You know, really, your staff should see the vision and the path you're laying out and, and you want everybody headed in the right direction. There's like a there's a saying in football, uh, you know, if if you're all wrong, you're all right. Meaning as long as you're all on the same page, you can never be wrong. Right. It may not be the exact way we drew it up on, in the playbook, but as long as everybody's on the same page, you're good. That's alignment. Um I want to respect your time here, Coach, and thanks so much for joining us. But wanted to end with a few fun questions. Again, just trying to get to get to know you a little bit, introduce you to the fan base. And I love this question. Uh, what is your earliest basketball memory? 
first time I, I started playing organized basketball, I think I was in kinder, first grade, going into first grade. My mom signed me up for bitty basketball and I played with so much aggression. Uh, she made me wear sweatpants in day two because I had floor burns all over my legs. It was, it was a release for someone that had a lot of energy and, and passion for something. And, and luckily she signed me up. And, and since that moment, uh, this sport has consumed me. What's one word you would be most proud to hear yourself described as uh, from one of your former players? A giver. A giver. A giver. Could you expand on that? My time, um, share anything that I learn, uh, share anything that I that I achieve. Um, I realize that any success I have as a coach is because of all of the people that I work with. Uh, and, and I'm not naive to that. Um, so you, whatever it is, I, I, I pride myself on, on trying to help and give, give away a lot more than I receive. Uh, but I've, I've received a lot over the years. So, I, I, you know, I'm just trying to keep up. The best coaches, when, when people ask me, hey, what's, what's the best coach? It, and I, I rarely talk about a specific in-game memory. It's all about the relationship. It's about life. Uh, to me, that's what giver means when you say that. I think that's a great answer. All right. In five years, Michigan basketball will be? Oh, it's a, 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 something that, that's marked on your calendar. That it's, it's an event to watch. It's something that is special. And uh, you can feel it. Um, you're proud to, to, to be a part of it. You're proud to be associated with it. But most importantly, you're proud that that group is representing your, your university. I love that answer. All right. So we're you're, the, the worst of the winter months are behind you, but I do have to ask you what you're going to miss most about Boca Raton. <laughs> the clear skies in, in January. Uh, it was an office rule, unofficial rule, where if you took a call, you and meet, and it was going to be more than a one minute call. You immediately got up, walked out of your office, out the doors, and and walked around the the gym. Uh, you know, our, our gym was small, so we, <laughs> but we, we you would see our staff zigzagging in the parking lot uh, daily uh, anytime they took a phone call. So, well, all the science now, everybody's saying cold exposure is good for you, so you'll just be extra healthy walking around campus in January here in Ann Arbor. Get you a nice coat, some gloves, some nice boots. Uh, all right, last question here. What are you most excited for about the town, about the fan base outside of the football program? What are you excited for about Ann Arbor? Just to be a part of this community. It's it's such uh, you have so many unique uh, people and I'm curious by nature. So just to dive into to the culture and be a part of something that, that that's as great as, as this place is. Um, the people that have reached out um, it has been it, it's been overwhelming because of you know, Coach Harbaugh reached out yesterday. Just the the, the people that care about this place um, and care about the success of this place is 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 touching. It's heartwarming, and and it's also uh, reminds you of the responsibility that uh, you know you're representing something great. It's so true. Uh, you know, anywhere in the world, every air I travel a bunch. Everywhere in the world, any airport I've been into, there's a good chance you're going to see someone wearing the block M. And you just say a go blue to them. They put the smiles on their face and they say, go blue back. It's it's we're part of this big family and you look great with the block M on you. We're happy to have you part of the family, coach. We're excited to see what you do with this foot or uh, basketball program and I'm um, excited and anxious to, to watch you guys take the court uh, next season. Will you be at the spring game by chance? Are you going to get a chance to, to go to the big house and watch some football? Most likely, if if we're not on, if it's not during the recruiting period, then then I'll be there for sure. I can't wait. I can't wait to walk on, uh, walk out to that field and feel the energy. Oh, it's going to be an amazing experience, and, and we're looking forward to having you, Coach. Thanks so much for your time. I know you got a busy, busy few weeks, few months ahead of you, so uh, we appreciate you joining us, viewers. We appreciate you guys. Please leave some comments down below what you're most excited for for the basketball team next season. I'm Jake Butt, he's head coach Dusty May, and this is The Lab presented by Champion Circle.